back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, rules the nations with truth and justice. Shine like the sun in all of its pillars. The King of glory, the King of glory. Oh 
believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Good morning, happy group, and please be seated just for a minute. Dr. Allen has to be away from campus today, so it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker for the morning. Ryan Bowman is the lead pastor at Fellowship of Wildwood, a Baptist church in the city of Wildwood, Missouri, which is located, as many of you know, in West County, St. Louis. Ryan's wife, Karen, is with him today. You can't see her. Karen, why don't you stand up just for a minute so that you can see her. Karen serves as the International Program uh, Coordinator at Westminster Christian Academy, and again, several of you will know that academy. I've been in it many times. They have one daughter who attends a local community college, and Pastor, please tell her we take transfer students at Hannibal LaGrange uh, as well. Two sons, one in high school, one in middle school. Their family has lived in the Wildwood area for seven years prior to coming to St. Louis, the Bowman served as missionaries with the International Mission Board. They lived in Athens, Greece, and worked with refugees and immigrants from North Africa and the Middle East. Ryan was president of the humanitarian uh, aid organization that gave access for them to assist with humanita humanitarian needs and share the gospel there as well. They planted churches and developed a module training program for pastors, which was taught in five different languages. Ryan, and I suppose his family as well, enjoys God's creation, especially times when they can get out on one of the family's off-road Yamaha motorcycles and enjoy God's good creation. I have enjoyed that myself in the past, so good. After our next song from the cha uh, chapel band, Pastor Ryan will come and speak to us.
Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Dr. Cardi, for the introduction. Good morning. It is good to be with you. It's an honor to be invited to your campus and to be able to share with you today. As I begin, let me ask you, how many of you in just a couple of short months will be walking across a platform to receive a degree? How many? A few? All right, how many think it's about a year away? All right, a few more. About two or three years? All right. Would anybody be honest and say, I have no idea if that day will come? I just like the meal plan, and I like the lot. Maybe there's other reasons to be here, right, other than a degree. Well, I just want to uh, uh, remind you that that day will indeed come. And I think that uh, when you get to that day, whether that's a couple of months away or a couple of years away, you are going to be hearing statements like, follow your dreams, seize the day, the best is yet to come. All of these wonderful statements that we hear at graduation ceremonies. It's appropriate for us because that would be certainly a time that we would call a mountaintop experience. In fact, for many of you, you have lots of these experiences that are still ahead. You could say college graduation, mountaintop experience. My, my first job offer, mountaintop experience. Maybe the opportunity to move into a, a new apartment or to a new home, mountaintop experience. For some, you'll, you'll have an engagement that's in your future. Again, another mountaintop. Then maybe for some, it's marriage, right? Then, then the, the birth of a, of a child. Each of these mountaintop experiences, each occasion to say, Thank you, God. Bless your name. But my message today is not about the mountaintop experiences. I'm pretty sure you're going to know how to handle the mountaintop experiences. And I think, God willing, you've got many ahead. But what do we do in those seasons in between the mountaintop experiences? What do we do when, when the season of life isn't a mountaintop, it's a valley? And it happens to be a long valley, a deep valley, a dark valley. Because you know that's part of life as well. And it's that situation, it's that circumstance that I want to speak to you about today. Because I've been in ministry long enough and I've lived long enough to experience these kinds of valleys, both on a personal level but, but also as, in a level as a, as a pastor, I know that, that there are many here who are training for pastoral ministry or you will be involved in a, in a local church and you'll be ministering to those who are struggling. Every mountaintop that I just mentioned has a corresponding valley, doesn't it? We can get excited about the new job offer, but, but for some, they're experiencing a job loss. For some, they get excited about, about an engagement, a marriage, a special relationship, but then others are, are experiencing difficulty and strife and tension in a relationship. For some, they, they, they're, they're experiencing the, the, the celebration of new life, the birth of a baby. And yet at the same time, there can be others that are, that are suffering the grief and the loss of a loved one. So we see that that is life. We have these different experiences. In fact, you can add to that that most of us at one season or another will experience things like physical, physical sickness or financial hardship or emotional health difficulties. You know that right now in our nation and even specifically among some of the younger demographics, we are seeing an emotional health crisis like we've not seen before. Even in the college years, some of you have had experiences which have caused hardship and even heartbreak. So the question is, how do we navigate the difficult seasons? And on top of that, how do we look at the world around us and we see the brokenness that is there? I mean... My goodness, just stop and reflect on the year of 2020. I don't have to remind you of what, it, what that year was like. 
with fear, fear of disease and health and the pandemic and, and, and unrest and, and division and discord. I mean, we, we can just look around and see that we live in a world that is broken. But how does our faith in Christ affect the way we process the brokenness of the world? How does our faith even affect our own suffering when we are the ones in the valley? Do you have a framework to understand both the suffering of the world as well as a belief that God is loving and strong? You see how there's a faith component when we begin to see what is the experience that we are facing? And you know, at some point in life, we will each have that experience that shakes us to the very core, a type of suffering that raises more questions than, than we have answers, a type of suffering where we, we ask, how? How did I get here? Why? Why is this happening? These, are, these two are, are part of life. On this earth. This morning, I'd like to give you a framework. A framework from the Word of God that addresses these questions. And I know it would be it would be fun for us just to stop and think, why don't we look at a framework for those mountaintop experiences, right? When when all is good and we're thriving and and we we're just see that life is flourishing and, and we we know that those are seasons too, and we thank God for them. But I think many of us need to find something to hold on to, something that can equip us, something that, that we can have also in being able to walk with another through one of these dark times. The Word of God gives us a framework called lament. Lament. Lament gives us a path forward. It helps us know how we can pray through pain and how to approach God, even when we aren't sure how to approach him. Lament. It's a loud cry. It's an expression of grief. I'm sure you've, you've probably used that word in a sentence. You've heard others talk about lamenting. And the word of God speaks of this as well. In fact, a third of the psalms are psalms of lament. It's as if God knew we were going to have these experiences and he wanted to equip us with his word, to show us how these prayers, how these songs were able to lead even a worshiper, a person of faith, to be able to approach God in a difficult time. Lament puts words to our emotions that we feel because of pain and suffering and questions that arise. Let me give you a definition of lament, and this is uh, from Mark Vrogop. He says this, lament is a prayer. It's a statement of faith. Lament is the honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. And you'll see his name, Mark Vrogop, a pastor from Indiana, He's written a book called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. Uh, and I, I just want to recommend that to you. Maybe one to jot down. If, if this is a theme that is resonating with you, that is the resource that I would recommend to you. And I'm indebted for the book. It has really, really helped me over the last year understand that I can affirm that the world is broken. That I can see that there are situations on a personal level or even within the world that I live that hurt, that are broken, that are a result of, of the, the, the curse of sin upon the world. And yet, I can also affirm that God is still powerful and that God is still loving and that God is still with me and that he hears us. So trying to bridge the gap between what we see and what we're experiencing and what we know and what we're clinging to with faith, that's where lament stands as the bridge to bring us from one place to the other. That's its purpose. 
to take us from this expression of sorrow into a place of trust. It's an invitation to pour out fears, frustrations, sorrow, again, for the purpose of renewing our confidence in our trust in God. Lament directs our despair to God instead of running away from Him. So, that brings the question forward, how then do we lament? What does God's Word give to us? And and there's really what you could see as a four-step process. Now, I don't mean to to say that they would all happen instantaneously. For some, it's it's a season where we go through stages. But the Word of God gives us four, and I'm indebted again to Mark Vrogop for for putting these together in an outline. And I've adapted my outline from from his. And and so here's the process of lament. Here is the first step, or the first part. We come to God. We turn. We turn to Him. Which again, may not be the natural response when everything is, is coming upon us. But that's the first step, is to recognize that He is there. Again, lament is a prayer, and it takes even even some faith to pray in the midst of pain. Now, the prayers may not be perfect, right? I mean, they may be filled with tension, and and there's just this, this messiness of whatever the situation is. And so we may not even be able to put words to it, but that's that's the goal is to is to turn to him. And I would just say that lament is better than silence towards God. Because isn't that sometimes the response that we have? Rather than, than praying, we just, we just shut down. We don't talk to God at all about it. We're not sure what to say or how to approach Him. And so, so we just stop. And that's where lament says, no, let's, let's lean towards Him again so that we can start a conversation. Maybe... There are some here today that can relate. Maybe even as we came and we had these wonderful truths proclaimed in, in songs today, maybe, maybe for some of, it, some of us it was hard to even sing. Maybe there's something that's taking place in your own life, in your heart, that it's just hard right now to, 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 to approach the Lord. Well, I would encourage you with lament to take a step towards Him to give a word in His direction. Here's an example from Psalm 77. Listen to what the psalmist writes. He says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refused to be comforted. I think of God... I groan, I meditate, my spirit becomes weak. So we we see here that the the psalmist is clearly in pain, but he isn't silent. You know as well as I do that exhaustion and disappointment and confusion can cause us at times to pull away from our faith to pull away from from the one who knows our sorrows and who wants to help us carry those burdens. Let me ask you, whether it's a a human relationship or the relationship we have with the Lord, what typically happens when we're silent? What happens? We just, we hold it in. We kind of stuff it. We don't don't let, let things get processed. Counselors talk to us about that. What happens in a, in a, in a friendship, in a relationship, if one, if one person in the, in the relationship gets silent, gives a silent treatment, there's, there's things that begin to fester. And then if we're not careful, it can, be, it can be bitterness, right? We've been there, right? We've experienced that. We know that when we shut down, it's not, po- it's not positive. In fact, even hopelessness can emerge. Silence may seem easier but we know it's not healthy. So that's where lament comes in to say, let's, let's move forward. Let's pray, at least turning to the Lord. Even if he feels distant, we reach out. So that's the first step. Turn 
to God. Second step, we cry out to God. Now, if you look there in the, in the outline, you're going to see a word that may strike you as a little strange, the word complain. And I'll have to admit, it took me a little time last year when I was working through this to think, how, how can I complain to God? I know who He is and who I am. What, what right do I have? And so, so I really wrestled with that, that there must be a way that I can, that I can, I can bring complaints to Him in a, in a manner that is, not, that, is, that is not disrespectful. But this is talking to God honestly. It's vocalizing to Him the, the circumstances that we're struggling to understand particularly as we try to fit them together with, with who He is. God, you're all loving. God, you're, you're all powerful. God, you, you're, you're with me. You have, a, you have a plan. And yet this here just is not making sense. Here's how Mark Brogop says it. He says, when it seems that injustice rules the day, lament invites us to talk to God about it. Instead of stuffing our struggles, lament gives us permission to verbalize the tension. So don't misunderstand. It's not just simply venting anger towards God. But it's saying, Lord, as your child, as your son, as your daughter, I'm I'm confused. I'm hurting. I'm, I'm upset. This is not going the way that I had planned and prepared This isn't what I thought you were leading me to experience, and yet here it is. And so this is where a humble heart can still turn to the Lord. In fact, if you look at Psalm 13, we're going to be in Psalm 13 the rest of our time. You will will see an example in Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me? Agony in my mind every day. How long will my enemy dominate me? Did you catch that? Four questions in two verses. Now the psalmist, he knows God's there. That's why he's talking to him. He knows that God hasn't forgotten him, but yet he may feel as if God has forgotten him. Can I ask you this morning, have you been there? Have you been in one of those seasons where you just are asking those hard questions? I'm always reminded in the month of February of one of the greatest trials that our family ever went through. This coming Saturday is the anniversary of the the death of my father-in-law, and he died tragically. Uh, many years ago, he was, he was in a car accident, head-on collision, hit by a drunk driver. Here's a man, and at that time, he was a teacher, 10th grade English at the local, local high school, had been helping as a coach, had been his entire teaching career in one school. Lots of influence, lots of, 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 of Christian testimony in this place. And then, just like that, he's gone. And you can imagine the, the, the heartache, the heartbreak for our family, right? Just, just trying to process, Lord, why? How? How do, we, how do we understand this? And so this idea of complaint is, is something that, that resonates from that experience that I went through. And I, and I know that as I mentioned that, when many of you are recalling things that you have walked through as well, where you've wondered how, why? In pastoral ministry, there are times that I'm called alongside to walk with, with the family in difficult situations. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a health concern. Maybe it's surgeries, certainly funerals. But I'll tell you, in a three-year period, I had, fun- I had two funerals for two children. A seven-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy. And I tell you, watching these families, asking these questions, Lord, how could this happen? We believe in you. We trust in you. We have faith in you. And yet the world that we're living in is just 
falling apart. But I saw, I saw an example of lament because they did turn. Even in the tears, even in the, in the questions and in the struggle, they were, 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 were before the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that they did not stay right there. Yes, they turned. They complained. We do that in lament. But it's not something we don't just stay in complaint. We move to the next one. What's the next step? We seek help from God. We ask. And this is probably the step that we're the most familiar with, right? And we pray and ask God, help me, give me comfort, give me peace, give me wisdom. And those are all very appropriate prayers. But do you see how they are a little different when they flow out of this process? Or, if we get real honest, if we're still in the silent treatment and we haven't turned to God, we might not get to the point where we're asking for healing comfort and wisdom. So that's why it's so important that as followers of Christ, we embrace this framework of lament. This is how we are moved from the why questions on to the who questions. Not just why is this happening, but now, Lord, what are you able to do? Who are you in light of this? Again, Psalm 13 Gives us an example. Verse 3, consider me and answer me, Lord. Restore brightness to my eyes. Otherwise, I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have triumphed over him. And my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. Do you see the requests that are here? You might even underline them. Consider me. Answer me. Restore life. Restore brightness to my eyes. Just think of the imagery of what the psalmist is communicating here. Wanting to to be back into that place where, where his eyes are filled with life again. Hope. This is, again, the step of asking God what is needed. It might be provision. It might be healing. It might be comfort. Maybe it's peace. Maybe it's faith. It's a focus on God's ability to bring what is needed at that time. And that honors him. He wants to come alongside the brokenhearted. He wants to be a refuge, a rock, a healer. He wants to be the one that we draw to underneath the shadow of his wings. So first we turn, second we complain, three we ask, and four we trust. This is the final step. You see, the the, the path has gotten to the point where we now can express confidence in God. And I tell you, friends, there is no more powerful of a testimony when someone has gone through that season of suffering and they're on the other side testifying to the grace of God, or the strength of God, or the hope that they have that is not of this world. And some of you have those testimonies. And you look back and you see how God brought you through, how he was there. And you're able to express a deeper level of confidence in him because of how you have walked with him. So we see that turning and complaining and asking land at trust. Again, Psalm 13, same psalm we've been reading. Just look at verses 5 and 6. It says, But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. That is the turning point. In fact, the first word of verse 5 is but. It's like, here's the change. Here's the turning point. This is where I was with the, with the complaining and the asking. And now, here I am with confidence. Now, I'm not saying this all happened in a five-minute span, right? It, it might have been a five-day or five-week span, right? Five-month span. It may have been seasons to get to this point. 
But here the psalmist is. The complaining is over. The asking is over. And now the confidence in God is being expressed. Notice how the trust leads us to a place of shalom. You know that word, shalom? A Hebrew word? Oftentimes used as a greeting, right? To almost say like peace. Peace. Peace be unto you. We, we think of it as that. But it's such a rich word. You know, peace is something we oftentimes think of to say the, the, the absence of conflict or the absence of war. But, but shalom is much more than that. It means well-being. It means wholeness. Sometimes it's translated in the Bible as flourish or thrive. And that's what it was like at the beginning of creation. Of course, shalom was interrupted with the curse of sin. And we know that there will be a day when shalom is fully restored, right? And we're kind of living in between those two time periods, but we can still experience a taste of that wholeness, a taste of those things being made right. So this is the confidence that we end with. Let me give you one other passage. It's Psalm 34, and I, I didn't get a slide for this one, but you could jot it down. Psalm 34, 17 and 18. It says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. Let me read that again. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. So friends, this is the God we've been worshiping today. This is the God who wants us to draw near to Him. So again, the four steps, turn, complain, ask, and trust. Let me conclude by asking you to consider when is lament appropriate. Here's the short answer. If someone is hurting or grieving, lament is appropriate. Again, remember that early definition. Lament is a prayer in pain. So if pain is present, lament is appropriate. Let's make it personal. When you look at your own life, is there reason for lament? Is there something that, that you have been struggling with, walking through, burdened by? Is there something that you've become silent before God about? See, I wish that I could have understood how lament worked when I was your age. I wish that the, the experiences that I've been through, I've been out of college for 25 years. I've seen a lot in that time. I'd love to have, have had a, a framework in which to try to place some of the, the brokenness of the world. And so I offer it to you. And I pray that, that, that it may be something that, that you say, well, this might be something for the future. I'm going to go through some mountaintops and I'm sure I'll have some valleys. And that's probably the case for many people here. But there could be some who say, no, Ryan, that, that right now is what I'm going through. Lament is for today, or it's with a friend that is walking through, and I've, I've struggled to know how to encourage. Well, I offer it to you and pray that the Lord will use it. Again, as believers affirming that the world is broken, but yes, God is powerful, and He is faithful. As I said a minute ago, we live right now in that space in between. That space in between. We know there will be a day, right? There will be a day in which He will make all things new. Revelation 21.4 talks about that day. That Revelation 21.4 time in which God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more. Because the previous things have passed away. Let me just say this. 
there will be no need for lament in heaven. Isn't that good? Lament is only for now, for this season. But there is that day. And we look forward to when we will experience that. But for now, we hold on to the Lord. And as I said, maybe for some of us, we need to lament. Why? Drive us back to Him. To open up that conversation again. And to restore trust and confidence in our loving God. I'd be honored if I could pray for you. Would you bow with me? And I know you may not have been expecting a heavy message today. And I realize that. So I'd like for us to take a couple minutes and just go before the Lord. I know for some of us it's, it's just been kind of an academic exercise and something just to, to hear and, and move past. But for, for some, this has been a heavy moment. And there have been some things that, that have been maybe brought up to the surface. And so I want to pray for you. And I'd ask if you would, let's bow. And as part of your response, if that's where you find yourself today, would you raise your hand? If today is a day where you're lamenting, could I pray specifically for you? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. And what about those who are worried about someone else? You have someone in your life that you, you care deeply about. Do you have anyone? Would you raise your hand so we could pray for, for them? Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, you see, you see the hands that were raised. And beyond that, you see the hearts that are present. And God, we know that that you not only see and know, you care deeply. So God, I pray for these. I pray for these that are in the auditorium today. I pray for these who are, who are watching online. God, I pray that they, right now, will experience the beginning steps of lament. God, help them as they desire to see that path forward that will lead them to trust. God, I thank you that your word is sufficient and that your spirit uses it to guide us and to, to, to uplift us and to heal us. So, Father, we pray for one another today. We pray for specific needs and concerns, for hardships and heartaches, God, you are big, and you are able. And so we ask, Lord, for you to do your work, the work only you can do. Father, we look forward to that day, that day when all of the pain and all of the suffering is finally over, the victory declared, in which death and grief and pain will be no more. But until that day comes, Father, may May we seek to live close to you. And may we be able to share this hope with the world around us, particularly today, the day in which we live. Father, I thank you for these students. I thank you for faculty members and administrators, for each one that has been a part of our time together today. Lord, may your blessings come now as we pray for this. In the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you again for the invitation. It's been a joy to be with you. You are dismissed.